Sean. Whoa. Hey, there's no sitting down just yet. Everybody stay standing. So I'm going to break this room in half. Right down the middle of that table. So everybody on that side of the table, you're on one team. Everybody on that side of the table, you're on another team. So when I point to this side of the room, you're going to yell the word live. When I point to that side, you're going to yell the word life. Let's rehearse, shall we? All right. So everybody over here, are you ready? One, two, three. Live. That was pretty good. About an eight. Let me hear a ten. Live. That's better. How about that side? Life. Life. So good. No, there's no sitting yet. So now start to hop over. Uh-huh. Give me something to get the arms in the air. Just like that. I want you to move. You've been sitting on your butts. All right, here we go. We rehearsed the first part. This is the second part. We're going to combine the two. Here we go. There's no stopping. Yeah, just check it. Very nice. Everybody have a seat. Yeah? What's up, dude? Uh, hello, everybody. I want to just, it's just a real pleasure to be here. It's just really awesome. I was at CNN yesterday doing some segments uh, in Atlanta, and uh, I'm going to be in Miami tomorrow, and then I go to uh, four military bases uh, here in Florida, and then I go to Dallas and Denver, and then I go to home for like 40 minutes. And then I go to Japan and South Korea. But uh, it's just kind of the nature of my, my life right now, and it's an absolute blast. Um, but it wasn't always like that. You know, uh, I'm going to give you a sort of a general sense of my story. When I was a young lad, a wee lad, a young boy, uh, I was a pretty horrible athlete. And I had a C minus average. That's optimistic. More like a D plus. I wasn't a great student. We moved about six times before fifth grade. So uh, my father was in the military. He was a, a tank commander in the Army. And so we popped around all over the country from Fort Knox, Kentucky, to Hawaii, to Syracuse, New York, to uh, Trumbull, Connecticut, to Rhode Island, uh, all over the place. So we finally settled in Trumbull. I was in fifth grade, and I had I don't know how many different teachers and different friends, and it was you know it was really brutal too because I also had a speech impediment. <laughs> Let's make it even harder for me. Um, but you know, fear was the most predominant feeling I had in my life all the time. I was pretty much scared and frightened to death as a kid, especially because I was a bad student, I was a bad athlete. And I had the speech impediment that really, really made it hard for me just to function from day to day. I would just be so afraid to get up and go to school because I was the kid that got beat up at the bus stop and got shoved in the locker in the whole nine yards, you know. So, um, but enough about the upbeat, positive things that happened to me in the job. Uh, the cool thing was, though, that, you know, once I finally settled into college, um, I, I was able to sort of make a change. You know, I, I realized it was a new atmosphere, a new place new location, and so I, I just decided that, you know, one day I was going to start to exercise for the sole purpose of exercising, because when I was in high school, I was on the football team, more of a tackling dummy, really, Monday through Thursday, uh, than anything else. I barely made the team. When I was on the team, it was kind of a miracle, but it was really so that other really good players could run me over uh, during the week. So uh, the horrible thing about the training techniques when I was a kid growing up in the 60s and early 70s was that most coaches and trainers and mentors, their main focus was uh, working with the best athletes, working with the best kids, working with kids that were you know, genetically gifted, and, and working with them so that they could get their name in the paper, so they could you know, really work on that win-loss column. And there wasn't a whole lot of uh, training techniques that showed the average kid how to get fit, how to get healthy, how to get better. They were just sort of left to the side. And uh, they were in the stands watching everybody else. But you know, PE was usually a disaster for most people. The first time I, you know, I did the president's uh, physical fitness test, uh, one of the exercises was maximum dips. Now, prior to that test, I had never done a dip in my life, so it was just awesome. You know, there's 45 kids in class, and you get up on the dip bar. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> there's the coach with the pad going. I think I'm going to ride a zero. You know, so such a bummer. Um, but there was never any, there was never a plan, there was never a purpose, there was never a goal for those coaches and those trainers to be more sympathetic to those kinds of kids that were struggling. So fortunately for me, I went to uh, the University of Rhode Island and one semester there was a weightlifting class. And um, I thought this, this would be cool because my main focus back then, my purpose back then to go to this class was to, you know, get arms and get a six pack and get girls. Let's face it. It was purely about ego, it was purely about, you know, the look, the size. 
I had nothing to do with the quality of my life. I didn't understand those types of things. And my diet didn't change very much, but I was in my teens, so I could eat pretty much anything and, and train hard and, and create some changes. So, but the awesome thing about that one class was the teacher from that class was a great, great guy. I mean, he had a great sense of humor. He had a great persona. He had a great style. There was something about him that was just so different than anything I had experienced in high school. Because he wanted the people in his class to get better. The, the goal was to have these neophytes come in, you know, fairly clueless, show them all the steps, and do it in such a way so that they'd be enthusiastic and excited about exercise and training, whether it be anaerobic, cardio, core, blah, blah, blah. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, plyometrics were probably brand spanking new. There was no such thing as yoga or really Pilates. We weren't doing that in New England back in Rhode Island. It was basically weight training and cardiovascular exercises. That was it. But he found a way and a technique that made it a blast. So I think everybody in our class got all A's and B's because everybody wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to do what he had to say because he was just a great, a great guy. So at that point, uh, you know, I, I meandered through college. Uh, I specialized. Come on in. Hello. It's my mom. She's backstage checking on me. How am I doing, mom? But um, so, you know, it was all about survival back in college. But it was really fun to have muscles for the first time. It was really fun to be strong for the first time. It was really fun to be able to run up and down a basketball court without throwing up, you know, for the first time. It was just those little things that made a big difference. Um, I didn't understand that my confidence was building and my self-assurance was building and that my, my uh, general state of well-being and, my, and, uh, and that I all of a sudden started doing a little bit better in school. I, didn't, I just thought I was lucky. I didn't understand that the fact that I was exercising on a regular basis was changing my mental and emotional state as well. Um, so I got through four years of college and I got a phone call from a friend of mine in 1980. He said, what are you doing for the summer? And I said, I'm going to go to uh, Boston. I'm going to be a waiter. Fired up. Wait some tables, man. Live in Boston, live in the big city. You know, take the red line, go to work. I, I, had, I had no idea. He said, I'm going to California for the summer. Do you want to go? And about a, a nanosecond went by before I said, I'm in. So I got in a car with 400 bucks in 1980, <laughs> thinking that's all I need. I'm loaded. <laughs> From Connecticut to California for $400. But we, we, would sl we slept in the car, and we, we slept in the woods, and uh, you know, we went to campsites, and you know, that's how we survived. You know? We would just um, eat crap. You know, we'd, stop by, we'd stop by fast food places. We didn't know. It was the 70s. I wasn't health conscious anymore. I hadn't lifted a weight in a couple of years at that point. I was just thrilled to go to Southern California. That was all I was really looking to do. And uh, I ran out of money in Colorado Springs. <laughs> out. Shit. <laughs> so I happened to be a trained pantomime. The other thing that I did in college was I did a lot of this. <laughs> oh, crap. Wait a minute. Hold on. <sighs> All right, here we go. All right. <sighs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> But anyway, um, so it's funny because as I was coming across the country, I had, uh, I wanted to bring my stereo in a couple of suitcases because you had to have music, you know what I mean? I got to play my Zeppelin and my Earth, Wind and Fire. I got to have it, right? So, so, but the crazy thing is back in the 70s, your speakers were this big. So I only brought the stereo with no speakers. So I was, you know, but I did bring my mime makeup and my mime outfit. So I had my top hat and I had my mime makeup. And for about a day and a half, I hung out in Colorado Springs, and I made about 125 bucks. Thank you. Whoa. And, you know, so, hey, it was a living. But, uh, and that's how I got to California. That's how I, I was able to pay for gas and, and the rest of my food. And for the first three months, I actually slept on, uh, on my buddy's sister's floor for three months for the entire summer. And we didn't care, because we were in California, and it was awesome. And, and it was sunny and beautiful, and there were beautiful people everywhere. We were not one of those beautiful people, but we were at least hanging out with them or pretending to. And, uh, you know, again, no, not exercising, not training, no sign of a business. Uh, I was going down to Hermosa Beach Pier, the Santa Monica Pier. I was going to Westwood and UCLA and doing mine. That's how I made my, every time I ran out of money, yep, that guy was doing mine at the pier. So, um, and there was a few times where we got pretty desperate where, you know, I would, literally be out of money and I'd have to go down to the pier and make about 25 bucks and I'd live on Cheerios and yogurt. That was kind of my favorite meal. 
and I would have Cheerios and yogurt for three or four days. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I was very trim. By the way, if you're looking to lose weight, hit the Cheerios yogurt diet. <laughs> Lean, son of a bitch, okay? <laughs> Thank you. I have, a, I have a laugh plant in the front row. Um, and so it was a struggle. I was waiting tables. I was a carpenter. I was a handyman. I was doing the mime. I was just, you know, messing around. Uh, and then very fortunately for me, at some point, I was waiting tables at the Bel Air Country Club, which was kind of cool, because I was, I was, you know, serving cocktails to all these movie stars. And it was just fun to hang out and listen to their stories and stuff. But it wasn't a life, you know. I mean, I was still living in a van down by the river, <laughs> for the most part. Now, a little crappy two-bedroom apartment with an awesome view of a convalescent home. I lived there for 21 years, and you know, I thought, eventually, I'm just gonna go down the stairs and into the convalescent home, and uh, hi, everybody! I'm 75, I'm coming in, you know what I mean? I don't wanna pay rent back there anymore. But, but, um, but yeah, 21 years in that one place, but fortunately for me, uh, I got a job as a runner over at 20th Century Fox. Um, which was the, kind of the coolest job I had had at that point, where you're just running all over town, delivering scripts, changing light bulb, feeding the cat, making coffee, whatever. But there's, you know, there's Sly Stallone, there's Dolly Parton, there's, you know, Robert Urich. Who? Anyway, <laughs> like four people, Robert Urich. Yeah, he had that show on CBS for like a half an hour. Uh, but, I, you know, there were movie stars everywhere, and it was really, really cool. And so, at that point, I started acting. I thought, if I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone, I have to start taking acting classes. And I wanted to get in the union, you know, and I wanted to just perform. I was always a performer. I wanted to start talking, because this can only take you so far. And uh, very fortunately for me, I got an agent, and um, I got, a, got the Screen Actors Guild card, and I started going on auditions, and I got a couple commercials. And the great thing about this production company is they were very lenient with my time. You know, they said, hey, look, if you get your work done, you can go on your audition. So it was a pretty cool life, you know? I mean, I wasn't training very much, really, I wasn't training anybody, but I began to train myself, be again, because the cool thing about Southern California, which was very different than New England, was there were gyms on every corner. You know, there were step classes and yoga classes and Pilates and bodybuilding gyms, and I had never seen anything like it. It was everywhere. And so at one point, you know, I would join one gym, and then somebody said, hey, why don't you come over to my gym? And I joined a third, a second gym, and a third, and I was a member of four different gyms. I was a member of World Gym, which is where Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno would hang out. And I would just, you know, I'd watch them and take notes. And go, Holy, he's 14 sets of decline biceps? Holy shit, how many? And how many are you gonna do? You know, I mean, these guys were in there for three or four hours, just, you know, let's do, let's do three hours of squatting, you know. <laughs> what's, what's today? Today I got four and a half hours of leg curls, you know. <laughs> that explains the hamstrings, okay. But, but it was cool, you know, and then I would go to a yoga class only because I was the only dude in the class, and that rocked. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, hey, what's, what's your name? Yeah, oh, this is awesome, great, right? you know. But I never got a number, took anybody home, but I got really flexible. So my balance, you know, I mean, I could do tree all day long. But, but the really cool thing was that I was diversifying when it came to my, my health and wellness, only because I was curious. You know, I had no idea this was gonna be the early development of Power 90 and P90X and X2 and now X3. It was just because I was trying to avoid the typical things that most people avoid when it comes to their fitnesses. It's just, you know, getting out of that rut. People just get in that rut, they get in that routine, even though they're committed to something, even though they're doing something, even though it's hard, even though they're, they're, they're training, you know, uh, with a certain amount of intensity, it just stops being effective. And I learned that early in my career. So I just decided I want to avoid the injuries and the plateaus and, and the boredom, and I'm just going to do everything. And besides, it just, I, just, I was allowed to meet so many people, you know. So um, my boss at Fox was noticing that I went from kind of a semi-pudgy, skinny arm dude to kind of a more lean, muscular guy. And our job was pretty crazy. They're trying to make, a move, make movies over there. And it wasn't an easy business. So I started training my boss in my buddy's backyard in his gym. And, uh, and that was it. I had a client. And I, I was charging him 25 bucks. I'm rich. $25 an hour. It was only one hour. But it was still $25 an hour. So uh, I had that. I had the carpentry. I had the handyman stuff, uh, the occasional mind gig. Uh, <laughs> because you can't do enough mime, really. <laughs> Seriously, you know, I mean, this is an important skill. <laughs> I'm working my glutes, my hamstrings, my quadriceps, and everything else. So, um, 
But the neat thing was that all of a sudden this boss of mine started getting in pretty good shape and people were noticing. And so he used to be in the music industry. So one day he's at a place called East End Management uh, on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood. And uh, walking down the hall, so Harlan's there visiting some old friends, actually looking to go back in the music industry at that point. And he's walking down the hall in the other direction is Tom Petty. So Tom Petty sees Harlan and says, Hey Harlan, damn. <laughs> What happened to you? What do you mean? You're all ripped. I'm working out with Tony Horton. Tony Horton, I want Tony Horton's number. So Harlan gives Tom Petty my number. So I'm sitting out, hanging out in my apartment, drinking beer, eating pizza, watching the football game, phone rings. My roommate picks it up. Oh, it's Tom Petty, I'm looking for Tony Horton. <laughs> my roommate goes, dude, it's, it's Perpich fucking around. It can't be. <laughs> What do you mean? If somebody says he's Tom Petty. Hang up. You're going to steal Drink. that cop. <laughs> True story, swear to God. Not kidding. Phone rings again. Uh, hi. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> it's Tom Petty. I'm calling. Christ, dude, it sounds like it's really Tom Petty. <laughs> what? Give me the phone. Hello? Hi, it's Tom Petty. <laughs> Hi, hello. Hi, I know Harlan Goodman, he got ripped. I got a tour in four months, can you make me ripped? <laughs> yeah, can you come to my house tomorrow? Yeah, where's your address? Wrote it down, lived in Woodland Hills, you know, the gate opens up, so you're driving. Jeez, I'm still in the driveway, holy shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Tom's house, rock and roll, legend. And I went in, I, you know, I met Tom, and I'm Tom, that's Jane, we're fat. <laughs> Just, just a fun, cool guy, you know? And so, you know, I put him on the, uh, the old life cycle. Remember the old life cycle? And uh, I got him one of those. I got him a heavy bag. I got him a bench. I got him some dumbbells. And uh, the first day, you know, I just kind of put him through a little fitness test. Uh, I put him on the life cycle. He lasted a minute 35 seconds on level zero. No tension. Put on the tension. You know. I go, so I'm going to start you on two. One, so I just turned it off, you know. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Well, you did a minute 35. Let's go for two tomorrow, you know, so. <laughs> oh, I got work to do. But, uh, you know, he had no idea. I remember handing him 12 pound dumbbells for bench press. You know, he's on the, and his arms just went, <laughs> you know. oh God, you know, so let's not dislocate the shoulder on day one. But, but he went from, in the course of four months, he got up to level six, half an hour which was, you know, what's it, 100 times more cardiovascularly fit than he was before he started. I had him doing 45-pound dumbbells on that bench press. He was doing lat rows with the 45s. He was, you know, doing push-ups. He couldn't do four push-ups. I mean, they were horrible, terrible push-ups. And he was doing sets of 25. I mean, a big, huge gain. So he went off on that tour that summer. And uh, he, you know, he couldn't believe. He would just, he would just sit and look at himself. Think, Holy crap, it worked, you know? <laughs> and he just had a buttload of energy. That's what really was the key. The whole idea was to you know, build up his stamina, build up his endurance, because these tours go on and on and on. You know, they're all summer long, and they're every other night, and so, or sometimes you know, two or three, four nights in a row. And there's Tom Petty you know, running down a dream with a freaking tank top on, and everybody's going, holy shit, that's Tom Petty? He's kicking the shit out of Bruce Springsteen. Look at him, you know? And so what was amazing, you know, and I went, I remember I was in Rhode Island on the 4th of July vacation, and so uh, uh, he calls my parents' house. How the hell he got their number? I, have, I didn't give him my number. Hi, it's Tom Petty. I'm a client of Tony Hortons. I'm getting fat again. Can he come out? So I, I hung out with him for three weeks for the New York, New Jersey, Long Island part of the tour back in, the, uh, back in 89, which was just crazy, just fun. I mean, what an amazing experience. And then from that experience, my phone, you know, it was, I didn't have to train Har just Harlan and, and Tom and a couple of secretaries, Billy Idol called, Annie Lennox from the Arrhythmics called, Bruce Springsteen called, uh, Shirley MacLaine called, Usher called, Ewan McGregor called. All, all of a sudden, you know, I was keeping half a rock and roll from the 70s alive. It was pretty, pretty cool, you know? And I was charging like $75 an hour. I was really pushing the envelope, you know? But, you know, there was no, I was still in that three bedroom apartment. I was still struggling. And uh, not struggling as much. I mean, I had my own business. I didn't have to do the carpentry. I didn't have to do the mime anymore. 
Um, but it was just, uh, all of a sudden, I had this training business. I was not certified. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, you know what I mean? I would just go to the gym and steal everything I knew, but certification, <laughs> that required having to go back to school. I was not interested. But you know what, what, the only reason why I was able to build my business is because, this is what I'm told, is that I was, a, I was likable company. You know, I wasn't somebody who was screaming and yelling at people. I was not a drill sergeant. I was not a, I didn't treat anybody anything, any, any differently. I just explained my story and how difficult it was for me to get fit, to get strong, you know, having never been an athlete growing up. And, and they could relate to that. I mean, rockers were not people that were traditionally known for their regular training regiments. Not, you know, I mean, I would go to Stephen Still's house at his, he, right when he woke up at 11.30 in the morning, you know, and he'd just stand there blurry-eyed with a, you know, a, a Fred Flintstone lamb shank in his hand and his boxer shorts. He didn't even know my name for the first two months, you know. Hi, coach. You know, and, and Stephen Stills is just, it was, you know, the nuances of having to train somebody who just was on another planet half the time, you know, <laughs> literally, you know. <laughs> telling me stories about how he used to fly jets in Vietnam. Really, Stephen? Jets? You flew the jets in Vietnam? I don't think you did. <laughs> I don't know. You went to Vietnam and you played some rock and roll and you were stoned and you probably fly there anyway. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that was a really cool thing, getting these really diverse personalities, these people who, uh, you know, where there, were, there was so much at stake, you know, had, they had such a, an entourage of people that were always checking in and making sure that they were showing up and they were seeing results. And uh, you know, for the most part, they were. Um, and, uh, and so all of a sudden, I had this training business. That's not, I didn't, you know, I was acting over here, and I was also training over there. These two businesses were very separate. And the acting thing, you know, I didn't really do the work I needed to do. I, I went to my acting class, I paid my acting dues, but I didn't really push as hard as I, as I would have liked. I was learning how to be comfortable in front of a camera and in front of people talking to people. But, but um, it was really the training thing that I loved because it, it, I had an effect immediately. I had an effect that day. Um, you know, when I would show up, there'd be, you know, trepidation and apprehension. And when I left, they, they would just hug me and go, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. That's what an awesome feeling. I'll see you tomorrow. So that brought a lot more satisfaction for me. Um, and then anyway, let me cut to, because I'm down to 37 minutes. But, you know, uh, fortunately for me, at some point, because I was doing these two things, I was building this acting, this acting career, or attempting to, at the same time also, uh, working on you know, my training business, um, I had two skills. I wasn't just a trainer and I wasn't just an actor, but I had these two skills. And so uh, I was hired by Nordic Track and I would fly back and forth to Minneapolis. And I was their on-camera spokesperson for some of their products. Um, and it was pretty corporate, pretty serious. You know, I did, my personality wasn't really able to come out uh, doing those jobs. So it was like, hi, I'm Tony Horton. Welcome to the Nordic Track line of really boring crap you're eventually going to sell at a garage sale six months from now. <laughs> All right, let's take four and a half hours to put this son of a bitch together. Here we go. <laughs> All true. But the cool thing was, you know, uh, you bring a lot of actors on a job like that, and they could read the teleprompter, and they could do the whole nine yards, but they didn't really walk the talk. They didn't really know much about, you know, kinesiology or, or actually, they didn't, you know, they didn't even look right. And a lot of trainers didn't have that sort of uh, acting background. So I had this nice little niche. I'm training, you know, celebrities. I'm going to Minneapolis. My life is but a dream. But I'm still living in that, you know, rent control apartment with that awesome view of the convalescent home. I'm coming, baby. You know, and, but if you got your tiptoes on the roof, you could see palm trees at the beach. You could look. You know, that's where it was. But at that point, it was just awesome not to be poor. It was awesome not to be broke. I didn't have a bricks and mortar facility. I drove all over town. I had two cars only because one would always break down and I'd have to have another one. And, you know, I had this old Mustang convertible, beautiful, but it would only really survive for about two months of going from Venice to Culver City to Hollywood to Malibu and blah, 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 all over town. And the thing about that is you could only train six, seven, maybe eight people in a day. You know, you'd start at 5 a.m. and you'd go till 9 o'clock at 10 o'clock at night and you were wasted and you're eating power bars. I would eat like freaking four chocolate power bars in my car between. Why did I always have indigestion? I don't know. <laughs> There's always, always a lot of agita and constipation from <laughs> TMI, my apologies. <laughs> But you know, that's, that's the way it was. But it was you know, a hell of a lot better than doing mime at the pier at, at 11 o'clock at night, you know, hoping you'd make about 25 bucks so you could eat Cheerios and yogurt. So it was a huge upgrade, and it was a huge experience, and I was just pleased and proud to be there. Um, but the cool thing is, probably the most pivotal 
moment in my life, and this is, if there's any one thing you can come away with, this is one that I would think is kind of important, it was super important to me. Uh, back in those days, I showed up to as many events like this as possible. Once I could afford them, I would, I would go. I, I filled my calendar with yes. Uh, and this comes from a kid whose main focus was no. No, no, no. There were so many opportunities that came my way, and I just wasn't ready. What is luck? Luck is opportunity meeting readiness. Well, I had a lot of opportunities, but I wasn't ready. That's why I said no all the time. But with every event that I went to, to every, every self-help book, if you look at my, my library in my office, it's adventure books, it's ski technique books, and it's self-help books, and also how to meet the perfect lover. You know, that was, I had a section down there. <clears throat> I finally found her, so that's cool. At 53. Um, okay, better late than never, you know what I'm saying. Um, but I'm glad I waited. But, but uh, you know, one of the books I was reading, one of the lessons, at the end of every chapter there was a lesson, something you had to physically do. And after the end of this one chapter, I think it could, even, it could have been Keith Ellis's uh, The Magic Lamp. I'm not quite sure, but that's, that's my memory. Um, it's a great book about just, you know, what direction you need to be going in when it comes to your, your finances, your, your partner, your family, all those cool things. Mostly career, but uh, this one, one little request at the end of the chapter was, go out of your way and do something extraordinary for somebody that you're in conflict with. Somebody that you don't like, that you're pretty convinced doesn't like you. Do the antithesis of what you would normally do, which would be punch them in the face, kick them in the crotch, and, and scream bloody murder at them. Just be super kind, go out of your way, do them a favor. And you know, typically nothing will come back, but just, just see what happens. So every Saturday I would play basketball with these lawyers, which was, you know, 50% basketball, 50% arguing about the call and who fouled who, you know. But, but uh, they were a pretty, pretty uptight group of guys, but it was a regular Saturday, Saturday thing. There was one guy, his name was Ben Vandebein. Uh Ben is the former CEO of Guffey Ranker, and he just retired at, at 50 years old, because he can. And um, didn't like him, he didn't like me. And we always made a point of, of making that very clear to each other. Whether we were on the same team or different teams, we would typically always get sort of an argument, you know? Um, because he, he was, you know, like me, a bit of a blowhard, so we had that in common. And at this end of one day, one of the, work, one of the uh, sessions, we happened to be on the same team. We happened to have won. We happened not to have argued that day. I still didn't like the guy, but then that little thought came into my head, and I wanted to do it that day. Go out of your way and do something extraordinary for somebody you're in conflict with. So, I th and, and at that moment, Ben was complaining about his weight. He was about 45 pounds overweight, great athlete, but his weight was preventing him from playing as good as he could. And so, um, uh, I went up to Ben, and I, I, you know, I just thought he'd say, screw. Hi, Ben, it's Tony. I know you're saying you're overweight. I thought maybe I could help you. I'm a trainer. I train Tom Petty. Never mind. Okay, bye. <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, yeah, right. That's right. You're a trainer, right? I said, yeah. Yeah, I've trained some folks, helped some people. He said, I, I think I'd, you know, let me get your number. What? You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say, no, thank you very much. I don't need, need your help. Uh, but just the opposite happened. He actually took my number down. I thought he was maybe just being cordial in front of everybody else. But, but he called me that day. That was a Saturday. I started training him on the following Monday. And so, and then here's the, the crazy thing. I had a Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday slot where this executive over at Fox, I used to train, couldn't train anymore. So I had this empty slot and all of a sudden it was filled within a week. And so Ben came over, you know, two of us were looking at each other over. It was really kind of weird and nervous because we had this bizarre relationship. And by the end of the second workout, we realized we had a lot in common. <laughs> not, not a surprise. Um, a year and a half later, uh, he said, hey, I got a guy coming to town. His name is Carl Deichler. He, he's, he lives in Philly. And he's a pretty creative, pretty creative, funny guy. I think you guys will really get along. Um, he created a product called uh, Eight Minute Abs. Remember Eight Minute Abs? That infomercial. That was Carl's product. And he was a little small operation out of Philadelphia, but you know, it's really, a, 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 um, direct marketing is one of the most brutal kinds of ways to make money. You can have the greatest idea in the world and a hundred of them come down the pike and maybe one will make it and that one will last maybe six or eight months and it's gone. And it's just so hard because they, you spend so much time and energy and money investing in this, whatever it is, eight minute abs or, or the sham wow or whatever the heck it is, there are hundreds and hundreds that never see the light of day. And if they do, they might, you know, you've seen infomercials come on and they never come again because you're literally rolling the dice, you're spending all this money on media and then, you know, you spend that money on media and nobody picks up the phone and then your business is gone. 
So Carl had this one little hit, and he came to California to work for Guffey Ricker, and I met Carl. Uh, he showed up on a Monday morning workout, we hit it off, um, and he said, look, you know, and Carl was doing infomercials for the silliest things. You know, he was doing infomercials for pantyhose that don't run, at-home LASIK, LASIK surgery, you know, whatever. <laughs> just take the laser, point directly with a straight, you know, no. But so he just, he said, I want to do fitness, you know, and I, you're, you're, I love what you do. And so we did a product called Great Body Guaranteed. He paid me two grand, which I thought was, holy crap, $2,000, it's awesome. And we ran out of money, and we had to shoot the other half of the workouts down at the beach without a permit at like seven o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> in the fog, whatever. Uh, but we got it done. And the crazy thing was that this thing called Great Body Guaranteed with Debbie Sievers. Debbie Sievers happened to be Carl's girlfriend's trainer. Who else can we get? Let's get uh, Debbie Sievers, right. And, and Tony, I like your style. So we shot this thing, and it made money. Holy crap, it made money. You know, I didn't have any royalties, I didn't have any residuals, nothing like that. I just had my $2,000, I went back to training my celebrities, and, and um, you know, surviving $6,000 in debt with two broken down cars. But, you know, it was a gig, and I was thrilled. But at some point, you know, the thing, we would spend, you know, $5,000 on media for that week, and it would make eight. And we'd spend six, and it would make 10. And we'd spend eight, and it would make 13. And it would, we would spend 10 grand. It would make 15 grand. Every time we spent money, it would make more. I mean, that's how it grows. If you spend five, and it only makes two, you're kind of screwed. And you can only do that for a couple of weeks, and then the party's over. So every time we spent money on media, it sold. And it began, began to build a company. And then investors said, whoa, who are you guys? Beachbody, this is, this is rare, this doesn't happen. You can't, this doesn't, you guys are new guys. You're not the big, giant company. You're not Gutty Ranker. You're not a lot of these other companies that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years. And so we got these investors. Carl came to me and said, uh, what's the next thing? Like, what's that thing you do with Tom Petty? Remember, you train him, you do cardio on one day and weights and cardio and weights and cardio. Can you convert that whole thing in front of a, a television set for people? They can do cardio in front of the thing, or maybe some resistance bands and a dumbbell. I said, how much are you gonna pay me? He said, I'll give you an extra three grand. I said, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and I did, and I brought Carl and, Carl and, and the uh, president of the company, John Congdon, in, and, uh, and we, they were the two test dummies. Carl literally threw up every other workout. <laughs> every other workout. The guy is so flippin' intense. He said, I have to get sick results. I, I have to look like crap in the first picture, and I have to look awesome in the second one. And he pushed himself to the very edge, to the point where, you know, it, maybe it was too much, but that's just his personality. I had to kind of rein him in sometimes. And so I put the three of them through 90 days. Let's make this thing, how long will it take? Well, it took me like four months with Petty. He said, you gotta do it in three. I said, okay, six days a week, about 40 minutes, let's do it. And they both got just completely shredded, completely ripped. Strength, explosive power, cardiovascular strength, uh, flexibility, balance, range of motion, all of it. And uh, then we had a test group. We brought a bunch of people in. We put flyers up in gyms all around, the, all, around the, the, all around LA. And people just called up the number and we had a whole bunch of folks come to a gym. And uh, we kicked their ass for 90 days. We told them what to eat. We didn't really control their diet. We said, hey look, here, here's a, a, a recommendation. Um, and of the whatever 50, 60 people that were in the group, 10 got results because everybody else just ate whatever they wanted. And they didn't show up necessarily six days a week, they'd show up three or four. <clears throat> our, our test control group was pretty horrible. We just assumed that everybody would do what Carl and John did, but they didn't. I'm not going today. I don't want to, I'm gonna eat what I want. I like pizza with sausages, you know. <laughs> so do I, but. But of the, of, between Carl and John and the 10 that got phenomenal results, that's how we structured our infomercial. And we put that thing on the air, and we were up to our eyeballs, really, in, in, uh, in debt at that point. And we spent, I remember the first time we spent, we spent 5K in media. Boom, it made 15, again, and then it would make two. Shit, have a good week, a bad week. Because what was happening was people were seeing this, there were, some folks were seeing it, because we're buy, buying wild spots. So you'd buy Poughkeepsie, New York, you'd buy Houston, Texas, you'd buy San Francisco, you know, uh, San Francisco, California, and you'd buy, you know, uh, Orlando, Florida, and you'd buy just a few. A national spots, half an hour, super expensive. So it, it didn't do well the first week. We almost canned it, the whole thing was over, we're gonna shut down the business. And then we just, what was happening was people were sending their, their before and after pictures to us. And we're looking at these amazing, this amazing footage, these amazing before and after pictures. So we took Carl and John out, the CEO and president, of course they're gonna get results. And we put regular folks in, regular folks from around the country who submitted their stuff. And all of a sudden, we'd spend five and make 20. We'd spend 15 and make 30. We'd spend 30 and make 60. And at one point, we were spent, with Power 90, we were spending uh, 
uh, around 500K a week on media alone, buying national spots, you know, on NBC, CBS, Fox, uh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings. I mean, we were, we were part of the big boys. And it was so bizarre because I, had, I was still broke, you know, but, but I had made a deal, I had gotten a royalty agreement. Um, you know, so Carl said, hey, look, you, you worked really hard. You deserve something in the back end. If this thing does well, you should do well. And, and what was so bizarre, I remember when those first checks first came in, I would, you know, oh my God. Because the royalty checks I got in my lowbrow commercial was like $18. You know, 18 bucks, I can go buy lunch? <laughs> and then these royalty checks would come in from Power 90. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm still, I'm in my, I'm in my 30s, you know, I mean, I'm, I should be successful by now. All my friends are married with kids and beautiful homes and nice lifestyles and skiing in Aspen and I'm still in my three bedroom apartment with the view of the convalescent home with two crappy cars and a debt and not a girlfriend in sight. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, digging ditches, but, but I just assumed that in my 30s I'd be doing better. And then all of a sudden these checks came in the mail and I would go, Whoa! Whoa! I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'm not going to tell you the figures, but it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. And so I, there was a certain point where people said, you know, Jed, you got to move away from there. You know, you got to move. You got to. Because, you know, and I would just put it in the bank, put it in the bank, put it in the bank. Put it in the bank. Mm, I'm afraid, you know. And then eventually they said, you got to buy a home, you know. And so um, to make a long story good, because I want to get to some other points that kind of matter, too, as far as building your business. And I'll finish with this. You know, I, I, I remember looking at houses. I saw about 40 houses, and they were, you know, they were, they were not very good. I remember walking into this one house. It was this, you know, five-bedroom, and I think I had a three-bedroom crap hole. Um, and two of the rooms were really, one was a dining room that I converted to a room. It wasn't really a room in my apartment. And then all of a sudden, I'm looking at this house with a view of the Hollywood sign, the San Gabriel Mountains, Westwood, uh, the Getty Center, you know, it, it, it was five bedrooms, it was a, a multi-level modern Mediterranean place with this separate building up on this hill that was waiting to be the gym. It was just waiting to be the I looked at them, it was just open. I said, treadmill there, boxing, ski machine, that'll be all open for functional fitness. I knew exactly what to do. And um, all of a sudden I was in this pretty groovy place, you know. And the clients would come over, and one of my clients showed up and he said, this is a cartoon-like upgrade, bro, right here. Because <laughs> it used to be on the life cycle, you know, with an apartment that was literally as close to that table, you know, and there's, this girl would hang her underwear in the window, which she had to look at. <clears throat> and now he's looking at the San Gabriel Mountains covered in snow. It was just a, it was, you know, I had to pinch myself. I couldn't believe this was actually my life. But um, there's a reason why all that happened. And then, of course, we did P90X, and that did, you know, eight times what Power 90 did. Um, so I was able to buy furniture, which is cool, because the, the whole house was empty, you know. Um, and then since then, you know, we've got uh, P90X, P90X2, where we were gonna launch P90X3 coming up in, um, in uh, December. Um, I'm writing my third book, I've written my third book that's gonna be out with Harper Collins, um, called The Big Picture, and it's not really an exercise book or a diet book, it's really about, ultimately about what I wanna talk about here in the second half of my time. But um, also Tony Horton Fitness, Here's a, here's a prototype, kind of excited about the clothing line. That should be out in January. Um, and then there's Tony Horton Kitchen, which is uh, THK, uh, which is a home delivery food service. Uh, it's organic, free range, uh, grass fed, beef and buffalo, bison. Uh, you can do vegetarian, vegan, uh, paleo or flexitarian. Uh, it's, it's fresh food, not frozen, fresh food, made in Oxnard, California in our kitchen and delivered anywhere in the continental United States. <clears throat> and we're really excited about that. You can go to TonyHortonKitchen.com and check that out. You can go to TonyHortonsWorld.com and, uh, and see what else I'm doing with the book and events and things like that. Um, uh, I'm working with ASICS, you know, sponsorship with ASICS and other, other companies. So there's certain things that I'm doing with Beachbody that are off the chart. I have a five-year contract with Beachbody after this last round of success. They just said, hey, we want to make sure that we have you for five years. It's semi-exclusive. But it's, you know, it's just, it's cartoon-like that this is my life. You know, uh, Sean talked about my tours. Um, I've been to Europe twice. Uh, was it the first tour was in Italy. That sucked. <laughs> We're gonna go to three tours, and then the rest of the week we can go to Florence and Siena and Rome and and, and uh, Vicenza. Sure, I'll do that. 
Um, and I do it for free because it's just the right thing to do. My father was in the military, I never signed up, and these men and women need this information because a lot of them are having a tough time. Uh, they have to take a PT test twice a year, and so the attrition rate's pretty high, and so the, 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 uh, the Pentagon and the Armed Forces Entertainment have said, we need you to come in there and help, help our troops you know, figure this out. And so uh, Europe twice, I was in Japan, uh, year and a, before the earthquake and hurricane and nuclear disaster. Whew. Got out of there just in the nick of time. Uh, two weeks later, the whole the shit hit the fan. Um, but we're going to go back. We're going back to Japan in, um, in November, next month, and also South Korea, which will be cool. And my girlfriend, we were supposed to go to Guam, Philippines, Hawaii. So my girlfriend was in. Then they took that out, and they put Japan, South Korea. Girlfriend was out. Yeah, let me see. Uh, nuclear radiation and communism. Not into it. So I'm going to bring some buddies, and we're going to go do that. Um, so you know what I try to do now, which is the antithesis of what I did before, is I just try to say yes to as many events as I can. I just fill my calendar with yes, you know, and, and I don't ex expect to get paid. I do gigs that are for barely nothing. I do some. The military stuff is totally free. I just put it out there. It's you know, it's about just creating as much content as possible and being, creating as much exposure as possible and creating you know the state of the state of the art products that really change people's lives. So. There's two aspects I want, I want to spend the last 20 minutes talking about. There's you. Raise your hand. We're all in the fitness industry, right? We all own gyms and we all have, have these organizations that help people. We're part of the solution. Am I correct? So raise your hand if you feel like you're in the best shape of your life. You're just killing it right now. You're just super fit. Holy, what? Holy shit. R really? Raise your hand if you're not. If you're not. That's the rest of you. So there's no not arm up in the air. But by the way, so because I was going to skip this part of the talk, but apparently I need to talk about this. You are your product. You have to, you have to walk the flippin' talk. You have to. You, this, you, have to, you pick that up, that has to be in there. All right? It has to be. Especially me. Can you imagine me showing up to an event and I'm out of shape and overweight? I mean, people, it's a visual thing. You're, you have to walk the talk. You have to eat like a king and a queen. You've got to train five to seven days a week, and that has to be who you are. Period. Forget it. Fun. No other choices. If you want to grow, if you want to kick ass, if you want to be, you know, uh, the, have the empire you want to have, you've got to do that. Absolutely. How do you do it? Number one, variety. Variety. If you're a bodybuilder and a weightlifter and you've been doing that your whole life, guess what? You're not on the football team anymore. Go to freaking yoga. Go to freaking Pilates. Do something different. Do something outside of your comfort zone. If you want to get fit and you want to get strong and you want to avoid boredom, plateaus, and injuries, then you must, must, must do a whole bunch of stuff where you suck. And go off it as much as you hate it because as you continue to go, the more you do, the better you get. When I first time I went to yoga, are you flipping kidding me? You want me to, what is the leg and the thing? and the crescent pose, and what is happening, and where now, am I, where am I going, are you kidding, right? Horrible, flop sweat in the first 10 minutes. But I loved it because I sucked, because I knew this is where I was going to get better. I still lifted weights, I still did body weight stuff, then I started going to the track. I started going to the track and I started working with Olympic athletes. So, and then I started doing plyometrics, because young kids <clears throat> move like that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Young kids <clears throat> didn't do that one well. Wait a minute. Boom, right? That's how you gotta move, that's how you gotta groove. Because if you're a fitness professional, sure you gotta have this, but you have to also be I'm exhausted, I gotta take <laughs> Where's Billy? Billy, you here? Where's Billy? Is he in here? Oh man, dude, how you feeling today? You didn't feed yourself this morning. You had to have somebody. Yeah, man, we freaking killed him yesterday in that gym. So gorgeous. All right, so variety, variety, variety. You have to expand your knowledge if you want to expand your business. You have to become less niche and more open to all kinds of ideas and techniques. So if you have a gym, it's a yoga studio. You know, you might as well create a fitness product for 16-year-old pregnant girls because you're going to help all 40 of them, you know? The idea here is to try to help as many people as you possibly can, to open up your knowledge, to open up your, your techniques, and you have to walk the talk through variety. So work on your strengths, you have your favorite thing, but trust me, man, start expanding into new areas where you're uncomfortable, and that's ultimately how you will grow personally and also in your business. Um, number two is consistency. 
And this comes with not only your, your physical routines from week to week, consistency means when it comes to, your, comes to your training, five days a week is the bottom, five, minimum. Three days a week means four days you're taking off, you're gonna end up with exercise bipolar disorder, all right? Because what you want here is you want your body and your brain to function well all the time, not once in a while. And the only way it's going to function consistently is that you have to move physically so that you can suck that oxygen into your brain and create something called neurogenesis. Neurogenesis occurs that when you train hard and you train often, you release no, nor norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and my little personal friend called brain-derived neurotropic factor. Brain-derived neurotropic factor is when molecules and proteins are sitting inside your dentate gyrus, this little thing, it's smaller than your pinky finger, and then when you cut open the, open the brain of somebody who's in, an elderly person who's never trained, their dentate gyrus is a tiny little dead black string. When you, if you cut open the brain of somebody who's been athletic their entire life, it's bright, it's pink, it's alive. And inside that dentate gyrus, when these molecules and proteins start to vibrate because you're exercising all the time, they come together and they create neurogenesis. And when you create neurogenesis inside the brain, your memory improves, your cognition improves, your level of enthusiasm improves, your desire to explore improves, your sense of adventure improves, your thinking out of the, the box improves. You, you don't have to go to school, you just have to move your ass. You know, you can read, you can come to seminars, you can go out of your way and do, you know, extraordinary things for people who aren't looking for you to do that. These are important too, but you must, must train five days a week, ideally seven, you know. So that doesn't, I'm not talking hard, you feel like you're not going to be able to, some days are just a chill. Pilates class. Some days are just sort of a level one yoga class. Other days, you are Billy and I in that gym and blood is shooting out of your friggin' ears. <laughs> Right? It's all of it. It has to be all of it, but it has to be consistent. What happens when you don't brush your teeth for a couple of days? Friggin' nasty. <laughs> all right? I don't want to stand over there when you're talking to me. All right? You would never not brush your teeth. You would never skip a night of sleep. You would never just go a day or two without eating. These are things that we know that we have to do to survive. What I want you to do is to thrive. And the only way you're gonna thrive is to get outside of your comfort zone, do things that you're unfamiliar with, and show up every single day when it comes to your business, when it comes to your physical well-being. Because you wanna be able to think outside of the box, train outside of the box, and that's gonna help you and your business grow. Three, intensity. Intensity, intensity. So this is really, the first half of this is really about your physical. So there's so many people who have done one of my programs and they don't look a whole lot different or feel a whole lot different on day 90 as they did on day one. It's because they never turned up the volume. You know what I mean? You've got to do the extra rep. You've got to start going to classes you're unfamiliar with. You've got to increase your range of motion. You've got to focus on your form and function. Are you doing these exercises, especially the new ones, well? The idea here is to avoid getting hurt. Crossfit. I'm sorry, I gotta. I know. All right. Slings and arrows. Let's go. Come on. People get hurt doing P90X. They get hurt doing P90X too. They get hurt doing insanity because their ego gets in the way of their training. It's in the way of what they need to do for them on that particular day. Some days you feel like you're on top of the world, you feel really flexible, it's 72.5 degrees, your humidity's perfect, there's no stress, you had perfect night's sleep, you did, you did a, a meditation the night before, that day you can kick ass. Other days, it's 58 degrees, you're down in the basement, it's cold as hell, you're sore from the workout two days ago, so you have to listen. You don't walk into a room with a coach who's got this drill sergeant mentality and, and do what he says because he wants you to do it. You have to go up to them and say, I did a mountain fitness class in, in Jackson Hole. 7,000 feet, day one, seven o'clock in the morning. There's this guy, Rob, he's all muscle. He's like that, right, top to bottom. Just, right, so it wasn't a CrossFit gym, but it was CrossFit-esque in the sense that the very first move was Tony grabbed that 80, 80 pound sandbag, all right, 7 a.m., 7,000 feet, first day. Now, I'm there when everybody else is on the first week of their, the first day of their sixth week. I just came in as a guest. Two of them there were, uh, were uh, Chicago Blackhawk hockey players. They won the Stanley Cup. They're good. And everybody else were 20-year-old were, uh, um, nationally sponsored free skiers. So I got hockey players, free skiers, I'm 55, yeah. So here's my 80 pound sandbag. 
boom, ice cold. Is there a warm up? Is there a stretch? Is there a, no. Oh yeah, nice technique, but whatever, I'm here, I did my thing. First move all the way down. On your back, come back up. Six times, put it down. Then there's a ladder, in, out. Three directions, both feet, three directions right, three directions left foot. Back to the sandbag, left arm, six times. Rotated, that whole sequence, both sides, six rounds. Oh, oh just gassed. That was the warm up. Then we did plyo boxes for half an hour. Blah, 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 blah. Then jumped over hurdles and then sprinted for 25 meters. Four plyo boxes, 36 inches tall, two hurdles, sprint, which I like that because I do that. So, but the idea here is how do you avoid overtraining? How do you avoid undertraining? How do you get results out of people, not of yourself? And the idea is that you have to listen. You know, yesterday I felt good. Billy and I were in there, just nothing was sore, you know. But today I'm not going to do my upper body. It's not a shot. But I'm going to do plyo and I'm going to do some core work, you know. It's creating sequences for yourself, working as hard as you can based on what's happening to you and listening to what's happening to you. Variety, intensity, consistency. I'm down in nine minutes. So, uh, number four, which I think is probably the most important. Why? Why are you training yourself and why are you in this industry? And why do you want to grow? What is your purpose? What is it? What is it about you that makes you unique, makes you special? What is your genre? What is your, person, pers what is your persona? What is your style? What is your technique? What makes you stand out? What makes you not necessarily better than everybody else, but what makes everybody want to go to you? And, and that really comes down to having to figure that out. You know, for me, I had, a, you know, I had that journey of part actor, part trainer. You know, so I would recommend uh, who here has taken a public speaking class in their life? Yes. Who's been to an acting class? Improv class? Good. If you haven't done any of those things, do them. Do them because it really helps build your confidence and your, and your sense of communication. Because it's really about cueing. If you look at P90X, the reason why P90X is successful and doesn't hurt too many people is because I show you a modified version and an extreme version and one in between. And I say, hey, look, you don't like this, hit the pause button. You can't do this move, then do something else. You know, you can fast forward through this part if you want. And usually, it's, that's not the technique. People, I can't tell you how many trainers I've been in front of, how many mentors, how many classes I've taken, where they'll tell me to do something, and I have no clue on how to do it. And then no one, they don't bother to show me the steps. All right, everybody, we're gonna do crane with the right leg out. So, so the first time, you know, first time I did this, we're gonna come in. Crane, all right, I, I don't know how to do that. And then you're gonna extend the leg out. I don't know how to do that. You know, barely can do it now. Come on, baby. Oh. <laughs> you know, this takes some training and some cueing, right? This, you know, capoeira moves. You can't just, like there's, I was in a class, kind of a capoeira martial arts, weird class, fun class. All right, everybody, donkey kicks, here we go. And everybody just started doing donkey kicks. I'm going, what the heck is that? I couldn't, you know, it took me a long time. It took me a long time to learn how to elbow, downward strike, sprawl, elbow. You know, these are skill-based things that if you have a gym and you're a trainer and you have a facility, you're trying to help people, you have to know how to communicate with them so that they figure it out because there's a whole lot of people out there Again, I'm wasted, I guess. <laughs> Take a nap. Right, because who here in this room wants to grow and expand and get better? And make more money, right? So, purpose. I train because I like feeling this good. I like being this flexible. I like being this strong. I like the, the self-esteem and confidence it gives me. I like training with guys. Billy, how old are you? 36. How old? 36. Kicked his ass, 36. <laughs> <clears throat> that is fun for me. It is fun for me to climb ropes upside down, do backflips <clears throat> on a treadmill, and go around a pegboard like I'm doing it on the moon, climb a finger ladder with my fingernails and go up and down. It's fun getting on a slack line, you know what I mean? And, Jumping off and getting back on, it's fun. Did that stuff, you know, anybody, anybody can do this. You know what I mean? Like, you know, spot training, stop. 
Stop spot training your abs and your calves and your shoulders. Get out of that stupid linear machine that only works your posterior delts. I mean, holy shit. You know what I mean? Move like a human would move in the world if they're doing something like football, basketball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse. You know what I mean? You've got to, boom, you've got to move and use, use the human body, Mother Earth, and Sir Isaac Newton's law of gravity. That's what you should have in your facilities because that's the future. Take all that, take the leg curl machine and fucking burn it. <laughs> I like the lap pull machine. That's the one you get to keep. <laughs> oh, I like that one. But like Billy and I yesterday, there was no pull-up bar. There was this stanchion that had the slipperiest, most horrible grip in the world. But we got up there and we clung on by our friggin' hangnails, man, and we made it happen. Um, so you know, that's really the future of fitness. The future of fitness is balance, it's speed, it's range of motion. Power is still going to be there. Strength scope is still going to be there. Functional is still going to be there. That's all part of it. But if you look at P90X3, they're all a half an hour, and they're friggin' buzz balls, every one of them. Agility, where you're doing stuff like two pieces of tape right here on the. You're down, one leg. Well, you're here until I say you're not here. Upper left, wham. And you're hanging out, up and down, up and down. Over middle, down. That foot doesn't get to touch the ground. Maybe your finger does. And then over, wham, and then back, boom. That's how a human being moves, that's how it works. You know, my quads are pretty buff. They haven't been in a machine, haven't done a, you know, a squat or a hamstring, none of that stuff anymore. So, variety, consistency, intensity, purpose. That's my purpose. My purpose is to feel a whole lot younger than I am at 55. I heli ski a couple times a year, you know, Super steep, super deep, fast as hell, and I can do that a whole lot better at 55 than I could ever do at 25, just because of the way I train. That's my purpose, and that happens, bless you. That happens today. It's not about, you know, we were having a little flexathon last night. I lost. You know who you are. Where is he on there? But, but, you know, I like, I like looking good, but I also like feeling good. And so if that's the message that you transcend, to your clients and the people in your world, you'll have so much business you won't believe it. So get away from the aesthetic and get into the feel good now philosophy. That's my purpose. Number three, number last next one is I got a couple minutes. Is plan. So of all those arms that went up in the air, people who aren't consistent, you probably don't have a decent enough purpose and you don't have a decent enough plan. You've got caught up. You've got caught up in the day to day stuff work and family and building your business, but you forgot the most important thing, and that is figuring out when you're gonna kick ass and what you're gonna do when you kick ass. On Monday nights, six o'clock, I got eight people at my house, we're doing plyometrics for an hour and five minutes. We are jumping off the surface of the earth. Big lunge, jump, big lunge, boom. Boom, boom. One after another. Because if you do that a lot, you're just so flippin' strong. You're such athletic. It's such great range of motion, explosive power stuff. Monday, Tuesday mornings, the rotation is shoulders and arms. First move, out of the box, handstand push-ups. First move, handstand push-ups, four sets. Then we get in the parallel bars, dip, walk to the end. Dip, walk back, dip, back and forth. Then we do military presses. On a Bosu ball, this leg up, boom, other leg, boom, that's how I do it. And then I do traditional bicep curls until they bleed, because I have to, you know, have to do the arms and the tri. But when I do triceps, I'm on a stability ball, back on a stability ball, do it this way, so that I get to work my core for free. It's just all that, that's the future. Med balls, stability balls, Bosu balls, balance while doing strength, that's where I live. Wednesday, cardio, treadmill, bike, heavy bag, jump rope, ski machine, slide board, I rotate, three minutes each, five minutes each. I will not get on a treadmill or an elliptical or a bike for 45 minutes ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Who owns an elliptical machine? Who owns one? Burn it, burn it, go. Yeah, now I'm gonna do something real. 
instead of, yeah, anyway, so. Oh, oh. You know, so that's, that, you know, I'm like, hey, I like my old douche. I spent five grand on that thing. It takes up half the living room. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm a non-traditionalist, but that's the reason why I've had a certain amount of success. So, uh, I want to finish because I got 11 seconds. Thank you very much. No, I have a little bit more. Um, be consistent with your exercise. Get outside of your comfort zone. Start working on your weaknesses as much as your strengths. Figure out what your purpose is so this thing is fun and not make it about aesthetic, but make it about feeling amazing. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep doing this till I'm 109. On my 109th birthday, me and Sanjay Gupta, we're just gonna get high, you know? We're <laughs> just gonna get high. Okay. And I'll be done at that point. But until then, yeah. I'm gonna push the envelope. And the one thing I wanna say to, to kind of finish too is, what is it about eat? The only reason why I've had success is because I've got this particular style, this kind of persona, this, this, these rules, I follow the rules. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't take drugs anymore, I might when I'm 109, but I don't even drink coffee, you know what I mean? And, I, and, I, and the last thing I want to finish is food. You, that's fuel, you know what I mean? Don't eat pizza anymore, stop. Don't eat waffles and pancakes, it's freaking birthday cake. You're eating birthday cake in the morning. Put a candle in it, blow it out because you're gonna have one less freaking birthday if you keep doing that. I'm serious, it's about the food. Exercise and food, it's food and fitness first. Then you build your business, then you kick ass, then you go to seminars, then you ask questions, then you hang out with like-minded people. Then, then you can continue to grow and expand to the point we really want to. Last but not least, social media. Who here has an EPK? EPK, electronic press kit. Holy shit, go get one. Who has a website? Great. Does your website, look at your website, look at 10 more. Does it kick the living shit out of everybody else's? Is there something just, is it colorful? Is it cool? Is it a great video? Do you have great, great blogs on there? You know, you have to be a great writer. You have to be great on camera. Who has a YouTube channel? Who does not? Do you want to grow? If you have your arm in the air, do you want to grow? Get one. Start taking video of you showing people how to do stuff. Anybody know who Mike Chang is? Raise your hand if you know who Mike Chang is. Raise your hand if you have no idea who Mike Chang is. Mike Chang is the king of, of the internet, the king of YouTube. At Beachbody, we came in late in the game. I just spent uh, last week and the week before shooting 12 YouTube videos because Ma Mike Chang is kicking my ass. Not for long. Uh-uh. Your personality, your style, your, your uh, genre has to shine. And it's also about style. You gotta, you gotta just do something, to grow a goatee down to here and put some braids in it, spike your hair, wear giant picking, or there's something. I mean, look at Tony Little, he's coming, he's gone, but he had a style. <laughs> right? Susan Potter, she came and left because she had a style. The reason why those two are gone is because they didn't continue to think outside of the box. They had this myopic view of what they were gonna do, how they were gonna sell it, and they didn't step outside of their comfort zone. So the idea here is not to end up like that actor that got the TV series, uh, who thought he could buy everything and it was gonna go on forever because the TV series got canceled and now he's gotta sell and live in, a, live in that shitty red control apartment again. That ain't gonna be me, uh-uh, <coughs> not gonna do. I'm gonna keep living outside of my comfort zone. I'm gonna stay as fit as I possibly can. I'm gonna shoot as much video as I can and I'm gonna be all over Twitter. I'm gonna be all over Facebook. I'm gonna be all over Instagram. I'm gonna be all over Tumblr. Who's in Tumblr? Boom, that's the future. Raise your hand, talk to them. Look who they are, ask who they are, and ask them how Tumblr works. Who's not on Facebook? Not on. Dude. <laughs> We're not selling vacuum cleaners here, man. We are in the future. So, you know, and if you don't have people, if you can't do it yourself, you gotta find people to do it for you. And uh, if you have the bucks, then, you know, you have to budget for that. Everybody stand up! Okay. Over here, you're gonna yell N. Everybody in the middle, P. Everybody over here, E, N-P-E. Are we ready? N-P-E. Rocks! N-P-E. Rocks! Start jumping. <laughs> Jump up, get the arms in the air. Here we go now. N-P-E. Rocks! N-P-E. Rocks! N-P-E. Rocks! Right on. Thank you, everybody.
Give it up, folks. Tony Morgan.